Hey, my name is Russ Livesay. This is a, a second uh, series of videos that are dis uh, discuss fire forensics. I think see this as a big open item in terms of both criminal and civil uh, litigation. And uh, I, I think back to Todd, um, a gentleman. I won't go into details, but a gentleman that was executed in 2004 for a crime that did not exist. And I think a lot of people need to recognize that the ATF used to refer to Fire investigation is an art. Well, there's no room in litigation. There's no room in criminal court. There's no room in science whatsoever for the term art. You can't measure something as Lord Kelvin stated, then you can't understand it. You can't write something down as Admiral Rickover stated, don't understand it. So these videos are meant simply to illustrate, basically from NFPA 921, some of the fundamentals associated with forensic analysis of fires. That's to empower individuals that are wrongly accused of the tools necessary to fight an unjust prosecution. Um, so this video is going to target ventilation generated patterns. Um, the most notable influence for fire patterns is ventilation post flashover uh, consideration. What you have in a flashover uh, flashover is when you become ventilation limited. In other words, there's so much fuel, it's all on fire, but there's not enough oxygen to continue combustion. And what you see in ventilation limited or ventilation controlled fires is flames that appear to be emerging from openings, such as doors or broken windows. Technically, the flames aren't emerging. What's emerging are hot gases that are ready to combust. And as soon as they interact with oxygen, they combust. Typically, you can't have flaming combustion under about 14.5% oxygen content. Within uh, compartments that have flashed over, uh, there's portions of that you can actually approach 0% oxygen. So as soon as those hot gases emerge, fuel, heat, heat the oxygen, you have flaming combustion. So if we think about it, I put this chart up simply just for food to think about. Um, within a flashover condition, I mean, this doesn't always apply, but just, just think about this on a principles basis. You can easily have temperature gradients that are pretty close to each other from the floor all the way to the ceiling in certain configurations. But for that same scenario, you can have significantly divergent oxygen percentiles. And because all things are the same in terms of combustibles, in terms of temperature, your only variable being oxygen, then there will be some telltale signs from combustion that can be attributed to greater percentages of oxygen. So flaming combustion is located near ventilation openings, and this is specifically in ventilation controlled fires. This is because the products of pyrolysis, and let's define that. When you heat up cellulose or, or wood-based material, when you just heat it up, there's off-gassing. And what's clearly necessary to understand is solids don't burn. The gas is burnt. So during pyrolysis, you reach a certain temperature that you have molecular breakdown and off-gassing of gases that, if exposed to oxygen, can be ignited through pyrolytic ignition. Now, within ventilation controlled fires, as stated before, you have a lot of heat, you have a lot of combustibles, but you don't have oxygen. So, as soon as you have oxygen meeting those hot gases, they will combust. So, because our, um, air, air by mass is about 23.3% oxygen, uh, by volume it's, you know, 20.9%. But the calculations you use for combustion are associated with mass. And it just so happens that it's, it's pretty close. There's a little variability, basically between about 12.9 and 13.2 kilojoules per gram of oxygen uh, across the whole spectrum of potential um, combustible materials. So you can actually measure it as a function, uh, measure the heat, the heat release associated with something as a function of oxygen content. It's basically called calorimetry. Laboratories are set up with apparatus to do that. Well, if you think about a fire, once you have a ventilation controlled scenario and you have an opening, uh, you're going to have the buoyancy 
place the hotter gases, and they can only be subtly hotter. They don't have to be a lot, a little bit warmer. They'll be on top, and they'll be extruding from the compartment outside where they react with the oxygen. Once it's established steady state, you'll have an inflow of air, and air has mass. So you have mass, you have velocity, and consequently you'll have momentum. And that momentum is going to carry that oxygen from its origin into that um, structure. And it, this is a prime example. So if you look at this, what you see is down low, you, you can actually see how the air is being carried into this structure. You can also conclude that the heat flux, uh, heat flux units, let's define them kilowatts per meter squared. So it's, an, it's a power um, per area. That's the definition of heat flux. And for instance, the sun has one kilowatt per square meter. Um, this situation, realistically, you're just looking at it and guessing probably 100 kilowatts per square meter. So significantly hotter than the sun, even more potentially. So what you have is this air blowing into this compartment in this particular photograph. And what you'll observe uh, in your post, um, you know, after you've doused the fire, what you'll observe is greater damage associated with the combustibles around this doorway and along the carpet in a vector that matches the direction of that ventilation. And also, if you have an adjacent wall within, let's say, 15 feet away from this opening, you're going to see greater damage in the opposite wall of the door. Um, highest post flashover heat fluxes typically occur along the pathway that oxygen-rich air flows. So this is an FDS rendering. Uh, FDS stands for Fire Dynamic Simulation. It's a computation computational fluid dynamics software package that allows some more advanced mathematics uh, to apply to fluids and kind of like a finite element analysis. Um, and the software package, FDS, uh, then gives you the numbers and there's some programs that convert those numbers to uh, graphical representation. And this is what you're looking at. This is actually a chart taken from NFP 921, which is the guide for uh, fire investigation. But this principle is established here. If you look at the door, uh, so the east wall, the floor, the plan view here, um, you're seeing the ventilation causing this, this momentum effect where air is blowing in. You see more damage on the opposite wall. And this is typical for any kind of, you know, if you're going to have a broken window, for instance, uh, same principle or another door is propped open. Vigorous post flashover burning will not occur in the absence of oxygen. This results in leaving the pre-flashover burn patterns visible. But if additional oxygen in the area is available through ventilation, the initial patterns that occurred prior to ventilation controlled burning will be masked. This will obscure the fire origin. Let me explain that. And this is something that has, has actually resulted in false convictions because people don't understand this principle. In fact, the ATF and the USAF did some analyses um, recognizing this is a serious issue back in 2005, 2007, and, and it's continued on. But regardless, the and it's, it's more of an anecdotal survey, but for all the students they brought through their fire investigation class that were seasoned individuals, these were firefighters. And I, I use that term... <sighs> When you do uh, arson investigation, you're not getting engineers, you're not getting scientists, you're getting firefighters, and that's extremely problematic. These are not the, these are individuals that apply the term art to their field. No, no, that it's, results in false criminal convictions and civil litigation that is is just pure wrong. But one thing you have um, associated with flashover is, or flashover is when the whole room goes to ventilation controlled. But when you have a flashover and then you put the fire out before you have, you know, ventilation coming in and changing things, right at the point of flashover, put that fire out, you will see the areas, like in a sofa, I have some images I'll show you, but you'll be able to see where the fire originated, or at least have an easier chance of identifying it. 
what the ventilation does is it will obscure, it will destroy the evidence that did exist prior to ventilation being supplied to that area. Um, this is an interesting analysis. This was a UL test that was performed. Uh, they have a specific geometry associated with testing a two-story structure. And in this particular one, what happens is they build it, do a test. They put exactly the same furnishing in a second time when they build it, do another test. But in the second test, they tweak things a little bit. In this case, the vent that's on the left side is closed for this particular test. And the fire origin is the sofa. And you can see that fairly clearly. If you do the exact same test, however, have the vent open, this is the result. It's a significant difference. And the damage caused from ventilation completely obscure what would have otherwise been obvious patterns that would have illustrated that the sofa would, could have been a potential origin. Here's a similar situation. This is a first floor test, ranch style home. Fire origin is on the far left of this picture. And in this case, what the change here was, is they suppressed the fire immediately at the time of flashover. And then what they did is they ran the exact same test again. Only the second time, they extinguished the fire two minutes after flashover, simply to illustrate the principle of ventilation. And in this case, they had a door. In this, in this image, it would be on the right side. So observe the fact that this, this, draw, this, this cabinet, this, this uh, you know, closed cabinet, it doesn't have any damage. So keep in mind, this, this building, this room flashed over. You had flashover occurring. The, the carpet is slightly damaged, which is typical in a flashover condition. Look here on the wall to zero damage on the wall at the bottom. Fire didn't touch it at all. You have some soot residue uh, above the, you know, the, basically the top two thirds as well as the ceiling. Now let's take a look and see what ventilation can do in a ventilation controlled fire if we allowed this to burn two minutes past flashover. What you observe here, this door open, you have significant charring. The charring would not have been present on the pre-flashover fire. You have what's called clean burn. Now clean burn occurs because you have adequate oxygen. You're not leaving a lot of uh, products of pyrolysis. You're not leaving, leaving a lot of soot. The other thing I find interesting is against the far wall, this, this is likely due to clean burn, uh, well-ventilated burning from this ventilation coming in. You also see significantly more damage to the floor and to the set of drawers. So if you did have an origin, let's say post-flashover, an arson of firefighter who's promoted to a fire investigator comes in, that investigator might look down here at the right side of this image and conclude, hey, you could have had a fire origin here. And that simply is not the case. That's a ventilation related indicator. Here's another analysis. This is kind of interesting. Um, and it has to do in large parts because of the type of ob obstructions. So here you had this piece of furniture completely destroyed in this fire. You had an opening on the right side, and on the left side is a corridor that leads to openings. So you had air rushing in here. It was constrained because of geometry, but you can see that you honestly have more clean burn up on top. It didn't really burn down here or down here. It's likely that that didn't suffer burning, even though you were post-flashover and you have ventilation. So two different results. The former results so, showed much more damage, but two different kind of results due to geometry. And that's a factor that needs to be taken into consideration. <coughs> so the takeaway here is that ventilation-generated patterns can be greater than that of the patterns caused by the plume of origin. So if you're post-flashover, ventilation-controlled, near vents, 
that oxygen rich air rushing in will obscure the fire origin and you need other tools that I'll be discussing in subsequent presentations to analyze that. Here's another interesting example of this geometry effect. You had this love seat here, you had the door open, you had clean burn here, so a lot of ventilation coming in right here, a very hot fire here. Look on the other side though, there was really nothing here, it didn't burn this paint. The other reason I like this image and wanted to introduce this into this discussion is look at the taping marks. This goes to show the ventilation associated with your sheetrock seams. And it demonstrates why it is so important for fire rated construction that these seams are adequately taped and that the process for acceptance for occupancy involves approving or inspecting the fire rated construction before you allow uh, uh, certificate of occupancy to be issued. This is kind of an interesting experiment too. The fire is actually on, on the bottom wall, the, the opposite side you don't see. That's where the origin was. In this case what they did is they performed a series of tests where fire was initiated. In this case the door was shut. Uh, the expanding gases as they heat up were laden with soot and as you can see the marks around this door, well what that is those are soot marks, deposits left as the hot gases rushed out of this compartment as the gases expanded. Uh, keep in mind, uh, temperature and volume are inversely proportional. So, um, directly proportional, excuse me, as you raise your temperature, you, let's say you double your absolute temperature, you're going to double your volume. And that's the principle. You can actually reach flash over in an unventilated room depending on your configuration simply because of the existing oxygen. Keep in mind that 13.1 kilojoule per gram statement I had earlier for calorimetry. Uh, there's 1.2 kilograms of air per um, cubic meter at ambient conditions, you know, 20 degrees Celsius. So as that increases, uh, keep in mind you double the temperature of your gas you're going to double its volume at the same pressure. Uh, so you're going to reduce the density, in this case, down to 0.6. So you can actually have complete outflow initially um, up, to, up to flashover. It's, it's feasible. So in this case, you can see they, they did, um, it may have self-extinguished itself. I don't have details on this. But what I do want to contrast this is with um, a fire that occurred, same exact conditions exact conditions, exact geometry, exact furnishings. Um, over here you had a TV nightstand that was removed simply to demonstrate this principle of, of, of basically shielding. It, it shows some shielding marks here. But let's find out what happens if you leave the door open because the results are completely different. And in this case, you can see that there was a TV stand here. You can also see the momentum of the ventilation, the airflow coming in. You can see how it pushed the soot, uh, you know, about 45 degrees. So there clearly was some velocity here coming in. Um, it completely destroyed the TV stand. And what happens in situations like this is that the fire will go from the origin and it'll follow the available oxygen to the door. So it really distorts the potential patterns that existed pre-flashover that would otherwise indicate where a fire could have occurred. And you need additional tools for that analysis. Uh, this is an interesting principle. This is a UL uh, second story building example. Um, so they have a very specific geometry for these analyses. Uh, this is their second floor geometry. So what you have is an open door downstairs. In this second floor room, the window is shut. The vents upstairs are shut. And as you can see, it clearly flash over conditions, um, completely covered by soot. Uh, but you also see this, you know, an upper and lower smoke layer. Uh, so you can see the lower portions of this door, um, they're not as damaged as the upper layer. So you can, you can see that the layer of smoke probably was around there. If you have the exact same scenario, the exact type of fire only this time, let's open the vent or the window in this room, a much different outcome occurs. 
So in this case, you're pulling air from the downstairs. Fresh air comes in, and those hot gases blow past this door and out the upstairs vent. Once again, it demonstrates how geometry is an important feature here because you're not having the inrushing air from that window. You may have a little bit, but the nature of having the stack effect buoyancy from that hot air, you have the cold air downstairs, hot air rises, creates a differential pressure that creates a, a intense velocity that'll bring that hot air out. So in this case, this type of ventilation effect is going to be different than if you have a first floor type fire. So this is what your, your isometric view of that UL uh, two-story geometry looks like. The positioning of the door will have an observable effect on the development of patterns within the door jam because the fire effects and patterns rely on the orientation of the material. Sometimes it's necessary to analyze a fire and try to determine if the door was open or not. In this example, this was a this is basically a scale model of a compartment test where kerosene was burned. It, it, it didn't reach flashover, but it just demonstrates the gradient associated with that soot deposition. So this occurred with the door shut, this occurred with the door open. And you can see that there's a clearly a line of demarcation that separates the upper smoke layer from the lower one. If you open it at 45 degrees, you'd see an angled angle associated with that deposition. So these are some tools to use just to understand uh, as far as ventilation uh, features. Um, there's so many documents written on this. Um, heat flux will be higher in ventilation controlled fires near ventilation sources. Greater damage will occur near ventilation sources. Differences in post flash flashover fires due to ventilation can mask signs of fire origin. Geometry of structures and obstacles play a factor in paths of ventilation resulting in damage. Here's some additional references. Uh, NFP 921 is the best you're going to use. They don't have a lot uh, in that. I think it's 6.2. Point one um, is going to have some ventilation stuff in it, that section. So 6.2.1, you can look through that and identify some additional features. But the real takeaway is make sure you have adequate forensics. I'm going to go through several different principles and create a playlist. Uh, this is just one. I've already submitted char. Um, the intent here is just to acquaint people with these principles so that juries are not so dependent on perhaps non-expert expert witnesses. And let me just give you a couple instances. I mentioned Todd Willingham before. Uh, he was the gentleman, he was executed in 2004 because of a, 2000, a 1991 fire that he was convicted of starting, um, killed three, his three kids. And it was really bad, um, the court scene. Um, the fire didn't actually start via arson. There were other factors at play and it was obvious. You had some really bogus uh, fire investigators that were firefighters and said, oh, it just, you had some strange charring, blah, 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 blah. No, 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 no. They, they gave testimony that was ignorant, that was an art foundation. Uh, there's another case back east. Um, a guy was convicted, um, a kid actually was convicted of starting a fire. It, it, and what happened, this is interesting. They found gasoline residue. And, you know, th there were some other circumstances that, that pointed to this guy. But he was convicted, f and the investigator said that he poured f gasoline everywhere and ignited it. And he just maintained his innocence. And what ended up happening is the Innocence Project went and uh, did some additional sampling. And yet, look, there's, there's uh, gasoline there. But it's leaded gasoline. So the leaded gasoline had been discontinued decades before this fire happened. And what had happened, it's a very common event. Uh, people use gasoline as a solvent to remove, you know, lacquer, to remove other kind of, you know, oil-based materials, or even as a thinner for oil-based paints and polyurethane. And it's very common. And people have been convicted and serves jail time because gasoline was found in residue and they had nothing to do with the fire. 
Um, another oh boy, there are lots of cases. Look, West. Maybe someday I'll talk about the Westcliff uh, case. But I guess what I'm getting at is just just make sure you understand that there's other arguments. Um, and if you want to look at uh, Willingham, Todd Willingham, there, there's several sources on YouTube that you can go and watch, and it'll explain some of the evidence that was overlooked. Anyway, I appreciate your time. These are some references you can look up as well. Um, this uh, this bottom one, this is a UL study. It's probably the best you're going to find out there, uh, a very powerful study that'll help you with, uh, with the forensics. Hey, thank you, and have a good day.